Uh, but today we're joined by Sarah Church, who's come to us from SLAC, uh, Stanford. Uh, Sarah got her BA and PhD at Cambridge in the UK, uh, and then uh, spent some time as a research assistant at uh, uh, University College London before coming across to the US and working at Berkeley in 1994. Uh, she also uh, did a stint at Caltech before coming up to Stanford uh, in 1999. Uh, she was appointed the deputy director of uh, the Kaipak uh, Institute at uh, SLAC in 2007. Her interests are uh, observational cosmology and uh, cosmic microwave background anisotropy, uh, and uh, also uh, the uh, Sunyev Zedvedich effect. Zoldovich, yeah. Zoldovich effect, Zoldovich. perhaps the most yeah. uh, uh, tricky name in uh, cosmic <laughs> microwave background uh, studies, so we're going to hopefully hear the correct pronunciation of that uh, from Sarah when she talked to us about the quad experiment, which is going to look at the polarization of the CMB. So if you'll join me in welcoming Sarah. Well, thank you. It's a very great pleasure to be here and to make my first visit to the SETI Institute, which uh, turns out, as I discovered today, to be about a mile from my house. So it's very nice to come down and, uh, and see you all today. Can you all hear me? Am I loud enough at the back? No. Okay. Shall I uh, speak a little louder? Okay. Good. I will boom a little louder and tell me if I fit. Okay. So I am going to talk to you about this experiment. Oh, it was working two seconds ago. Ah, there we go. I'm going to talk to you about this, uh, this experiment. This is a uh, telescope. It's a, a bit of a funny looking telescope. It's a 2.6 meter uh, Cassegrain radio telescope. And it's located within a, well it was located, it's now dismantled. But it was located in a large ground shield uh, at the South Pole. And I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about the, uh, I'm going to review the importance of what we were trying to measure, which was the cosmic microwave background radiation. I'm going to tell you why this is important for measuring cosmological parameters, that is, the parameters that describe the composition of the universe, the uh, uh, past history of the universe, and also that tell us something about the physics in the early universe, which uh, probes uh, regions and times when the universe was far hotter and denser than anything we can uh, mimic in the lab today. And as part of that, I will uh, motivate why we would like to measure the polarization of this signal and what the polarization can tell us. And then I will tell you about results from uh, that rather funny looking telescope. And I'll, if I have time, which I may not, but if I, if I have a few minutes at the end, I will try and set the stage for future experiments in this field and tell you uh, a bit about what you might expect to hear from uh, this field in the future. So let me start uh, just quickly reviewing the origin of the cosmic microwave background, which uh, is, is probably familiar to uh, most of you. The universe uh, is believed to have begun in a uh, hot, dense state. and. There are uh, a large number of uh, theorists, both at Stanford and elsewhere, worrying about how that happened. Uh, but the, the microwave background comes to us from a time approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang, because that was the moment at which the universe became transparent to photons. And so if you make a map of the sky at, uh, say, a frequency of 33 gigahertz, uh, it turns out to be 
at first sight remarkably uninteresting in that there's this very uniform background that was discovered by Penzias and Wilson. Uh, I, I think they discovered it approximately six months before I was born, so uh, that must be why I work on this. But uh, uh, the, although it looks remarkably uninteresting, it turns out that if you examine uh, this background in great detail, you can learn a lot about the universe. But it's worth noting that, that this, this radiation dominates the energy, energy density of the universe. Most of the energy, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the photons in the universe are in the cosmic microwave background. And uh, that's, that makes sense because it's, it's such a fundamental, uh, it, it's such, uh, it comes from such a fundamental source. And the temperature, if you measure, measure the temperature over the sky, it turns out to be isotropic to a few parts in 10 to the 5. And uh, that fits in with our, uh, with our present understanding of the early universe in that the universe is very, very, uh, very, very isotropic. And uh, the mechanism that has been proposed for uh, the fact that the universe is very isotropic, although part, the parts of it that we see, the parts of the universe that are on opposite sides of, of if we look this way and this way, they couldn't be in causal contact in 13.6 uh, billion years. It turns out that if you propose a model such as inflation, where the universe expands very, very quickly in the first uh, tiny fraction of a second, the first 10 to the minus 34 seconds, then uh, the universe that we see today, the present day universe, was contained in a region that was so tiny that it was able to be in causal contact uh, very, very close to the, uh, to the very, very first moments of the Big Bang. And so this is our current understanding of the state of the universe. This is the relative size, and this is the density of the universe. And so the size increased fairly rapidly. Uh, early on, you can see in the first uh, approximately 10 to the minus 34 seconds, the universe increased in size by uh, 40 plus orders of magnitude. And then something happened to end inflation, and the energy that was released uh, during that uh, period went on to uh, create uh, the matter that we see today and the radiation that makes up the cosmic microwave background. And the universe continued to expand. It was radiation dominated. And then at some point, the, uh, because uh, the radiation density decreases faster than the matter density, the universe became matter dominated. But today, we believe the universe is dominated by this mysterious substance called dark energy, of which we know very little. And you may have had uh, talks on that before. All we know about dark energy is that it pushes the universe ap uh, apart very fast. Uh, but the, there's two things to note about this model. First of all, this, is the, this indicates to you the range of uh, energies that you can probe using, uh, using ground-based techniques, including large accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, you can see that this, this part of the universe where there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on, including inflation, is not, uh, cannot be probed by ground-based methods. And the second thing, that, uh, the, which is what I'll talk about more in a minute, is that the cosmic microwave background has really been a key tool in testing this model. And from time to time, I'll refer to this uh, so-called standard cosmological model, sometimes referred to as LCDM or Lambda CDM, where CDM stands for cold dark matter, which is uh, believed to make up most of the density uh, of matter in the universe. So <coughs> if I go back to this very uniform picture of the cosmic microwave background, what we're looking at, so we're in the, we're in the middle here, what we're looking at is, uh, is a surface, uh, is equivalent to a surface that surrounds us at a time when the universe was about uh, 380,000 years old. We can't see any further than that because at that point the universe uh, becomes ionized if we look back in time and photons just can't make it uh, to us. And then the stars and galaxies we see come from obviously a much nearer uh, a much nearer time, uh, typically about a redshift of, of four to five. Uh, and uh, so, the, so we, we, we're looking at this background, this very, very uniform background of radiation. And the reason that it's special is because it, it really 
uh, really before this, before this time, so if you look out in space further, you look back in time further, during that time, the, the universe was actually very simple. So there was, no, uh, there, were, there was no sort of complicated astrophysics going on as we see today in the stars and galaxies. We, as you'll see, we understand the, uh, the physics of how the universe evolved after inflation. We understand that very well. And so if you see anything, anything unusual in the cosmic microwave background, it's telling you about unusual physics in the early universe. And so that's what makes the microwave background such a, a special uh, probe of cosmology. So if we turn up the contrast, this is actually a picture now from the WMAP satellite, which I, I, uh, I'm not associated with, but, but which has done a fantastic job in this field and uh, has uh, made vast amounts of material uh, available to, uh, to the public and other scientists, and, and it's really a fantastic resource. Uh, if you turn up the contrast, you start to see two things. You, first of all, you see the galaxy. So this is dust from our own galaxy. So that actually tells you, just by turning up the contrast, just how, uh, how, um, how much energy there is in the cosmic microwave background compared to other sources of radiation. Because here's our galaxy, and you have to turn the contrast up. You have to, to look at about one part in 10 to the 5 to see what's going on. But these other uh, hot and cold spots up here, so this is, this is indicating temperatures. So these are cooler regions. These are hotter regions. These other uh, hot and cold spots are uh, indeed primordial and are uh, true variations in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And these temperature anisotropies uh, are believed to arise from two causes, one of which we understand very well, and the other is the subject of the research that I'm doing along with other people. And that is that these, these anisotropies reflect uh, underlying quantum fluctuations in the uh, field that gave rise to inflation. That's the, um, the postulate. And these, these fluctuations, these quantum fluctuations, come in two forms. They, uh, they can be so-called scalar perturbations in the field, which lead to density fluctuations. So the density fluctuations that form the stars and galaxies. And uh, those are known to exist. It's not, it's, it, inflation is a bit of a generic theory. so. The fact that matter fluctuations exist is not necessarily proof of inflation, but we certainly know those matter fluctuations exist. But then the second uh, form of, quant of uh, quantum fluctuations produced by inflation are, uh, behave as tensor perturbations, and by a perturbation, we mean a perturbation in uh, space-time. And those show up as, uh, as primordial gravity waves, if they exist. Now, so this is, these are known to exist these are not known yet to exist, but are postulated. And if we could see them, they would tell us something about the physics of inflation, which is solely the domain of theory at the present time. So uh, when you look at this map, what you're seeing is the galaxy. You're seeing uh, primarily uh, these fluctuations due to, uh, due to matter. And I'll explain in a moment a bit more about the connection between the matter fluctuations and the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. But just to say that it, this is a, uh, a, a simulated montage from WMAP. If you, if you stared long enough at one of these fluctuations, uh, you would see over time, a very long time, obviously, several billion years, you would see it evolve into stars and galaxies. So these are the seeds of structure that, that then form the structure that we see today. In addition to... Uh, to the primordial, what we call the primordial fluctuations, those were, that were actually present when the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, was produced. There are a host of secondary effects, uh, which were, were, were partly alluded to by Adrian in his introduction that I'm afraid I won't have to, time to talk about much today. But the sunyaev zeldovich effect is the scattering of microwave background photons by hot gas that's present in the universe. If I go back to this picture, you, the other thing you can do with the cosmic microwave background is you can consider it to be a backlight that's shining uh, on the universe and illuminating all the gas that it passes through because ionized gas will obviously scatter those microwave background photons. And that's a whole uh, interesting separate subject. And those, uh, those fluctuations are not, very, uh, are not a very dominant part of the data from the WMAP satellite or indeed from QUAD. 
but they are an interesting uh, uh, source of information for newer experiments. So the way uh, we analyze uh, cosmic microwave background maps, uh, it's worth spending a couple of minutes on it so that, you can, so that the diagrams I show uh, look, look uh, reasonably clear. But what you, what you typically do is you measure the cosmic microwave background at several different frequencies so that you can distinguish the primordial fluctuations from the uh, galaxy because of spectral differences. So this is uh, thermal emission from dust. And, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite blue, and this is uh, a, a black body at 3 Kelvin. So by making maps at several different temperatures, you can, uh, you can combine them to make what's called a foreground cleaned map of the microwave background. And then what you do is you, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at these, uh, the uh, uh, signatures of these quantum fluctuations. So you look at the power spectrum of the spatial variations in the temperature, so you expand the temperature in any direction, n hat, as the sum of uh, spherical harmonics, just as you would any uh, field. And then you can average over the m coefficient of the spherical harmonics because uh, there's no reason to suppose that there's any particular axis to the universe. And that's an assumption which actually people are now able to start testing. But if you make that assumption, then what you end up with is you end up with the temperature, the, um, the, the power, the temperature squared, being accessible in what we refer to as C sub L's, which is the strength of the, of the, uh, the multiple at each multiple value L. And if you, okay, so let me, uh, uh, let me, whoops, wrong way. So let me uh, talk about, so, so what do we expect to see when we do this? Well. So the, you can see that there's the structure on many, many different scales. And where does that come from? Well, it actually comes from, from uh, the, the fluctuations themselves are quantum fluctuations in the early universe, but the mechanism by which uh, they, they uh, encode information in the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background just depends on actually uh, simple, uh, relatively simple fluid dynamics that, that takes place between the... Uh, what, what is a couple fluid of, of um, baryons and photons because the universe is, uh, is hot and ionized. So what you have is that you have initial uh, quantum fluctuations that, that, uh, that, are, uh, that are now fluctuations in the matter density what, once inflation ends. And these uh, matter fluctuations begin to collapse as soon as, they, as soon as the horizon, as soon as the universe is old enough for the horizon to be the same size as the fluctuation. So this is just a, a, a simple cartoon that shows the time. This is time increasing along this axis. And this is the physical size of the fluctuation that's equal to the horizon size. So the horizon size is increasing with time. So as the universe gets older, larger and larger fluctuations enter the horizon. But at the moment in this cartoon, the, uh, the matter and the radiation are very, very tightly coupled. So these fluctuations can't collapse because when they start to collapse, radiation pressure uh, will force them to expand again. So if the universe stayed ionized, what you see are these different sized matter fluctuations basically oscillating. You've got sound waves going through the the plasma and, and, uh, and different, uh, different sizes may, be, may uh, have different phases or different oscillation times, but they're basically oscillating away. So once the universe be cools enough uh, for, um, uh, for, matter to, uh, uh, for matter and radiation to decouple, then the radiation support is lost at this point and these fluctuations will now go on and collapse to form stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. But that process is then invisible to us until the first stars switch on, and then we can actually see the galaxies. So we, we don't have a whole lot of information about what happens after this point. There are new techniques coming online, such as neutral hydrogen telescopes, to, to probe this epoch. But there's no information about that in the cosmic microwave background because at this point, the microwave background is no longer coupled to the matter. So if you look at the microwave background, what you're seeing is, a, is, is basically a snapshot of this point in the history of the universe. And these fluctuations 
uh, will have reached a particular, uh, a particular point in their oscillation. But one of the important things is that there's a largest fluctuation that will have just had time to collapse before the universe becomes decoupled, and larger fluctuations won't have had time to collapse at all. So this process, this oscillation process, ends up enhancing uh, certain scale sizes in the matter. So certain fluctuations are enhanced by the process, so this fluctuation is, is maximally compressed at the time of decoupling. This uh, smaller fluctuation is maximally rarefied at the time of decoupling. And this one here is kind of an intermediate one. If it, if it kept going, it would be expanding. But at decoupling, it gets caught in some sort of intermediate size. So the, uh, this process here enhances fluctuations on certain scales. So if you make your, uh, make your uh, plot of the, this is now the plot of the, uh, uh, if you like, the RMS temperature variation at a given multiple, what you see is you see this enhancement on certain scales. So a multiple of 200 corresponds to about a degree, okay? And you can see that the uh, fluctuations are very enhanced on that scale. And so this is the fluctuation that just had time to enter the horizon and maximally collapse before the universe decoupled, okay? So this is, this is temperature data, and I'm spending some time on temperature data to motivate polarization data. But this is temperature data, again, from the WMAP satellite. And so what you see is that fluctuations on scales of about, uh, about uh, 5 degrees and above don't have any time to collapse before the, end of, uh, before the end of the ionized period. And as you go to smaller and smaller scales, fluctuations get enhanced. They get, these are maximally, uh, this is a maximally rarefied and so on, and you get these structures that are known as acoustic peaks because they're basically the result of sound waves. And, the, and the, the key thing, one of the key things to, to take away from this picture is that there's a big difference between uh, the science of the cosmic microwave background and certain other fields of astrophysics because this, these points here are data points from WMAP, and this line is a theoretical prediction based on uh, changing proportions of baryons, of cold dark matter, of dark energy, uh, all those kinds of things, the, the geometry of the universe, whether the geometry is open or closed. And in fact, this is this, uh, the location of this peak corresponds almost exactly to a perfectly flat universe. And, and th this is remarkable agreement between data and a theoretical prediction. And that's uh, not, not rare in astrophysics, but it's, there, there are not many astrophysical signals that we can model as, uh, as accurately as uh, the cosmic microwave background. And this is because, as I was saying, there's no, there's, there are very few complicated processes happening in the early universe. There's no, uh, there's, there's, no astro, there's no real astrophysics. There's no stars, no galaxies, no black holes, no supernovae. Everything's very, very simple. So that means that the only thing that, the, that this model really depends on are quantities of cosmological interest, like the densities of the different contributions uh, from matter and dark energy, and things like the Hubble constant. And to a certain extent, although it's a little hidden in the acoustic peaks, it also depends on the fundamental nature of those quantum fluctuations. So the, the slope of this line back here is related to the uh, initial spectrum of those quantum fluctuations that were Im imprinted by inflation. So the microwave background, uh, people who study the microwave background are fond of using this statement, precision cosmology, okay, uh, which has become a bit of a buzzword in our field. But what it really means is that because of this straightforward fluid dynamics that takes place when the universe is ionized, uh, you can get accurate theoretical predictions with cosmological quantities as the free parameters. And so that leads to this, uh, uh, this pie chart, among other things, where uh, we believe 4.6% uh, of the density of the universe is, is regular, uh, regular baryons, 23% dark matter, and 72% dark energy. So that's, uh, that, that's a, a, a kind of a long introduction to temperature fluctuations, and uh, it really sets the stage for polarization 
because we're, we're trying to do much the same things. We're looking at the spatial distribution of the polarization of the microwave background. And uh, polarization is the third measurable property of the microwave background. The frequency spectrum was measured very accurately to be a three Kelvin black body uh, by uh, the COBE team. These uh, uh, spatial temperature variations were measured by WMAP. So polarization, so the, um, the cosmic microwave background becomes polarized through Thomson scattering. Uh, it's, this is, a, uh, um, again, another straightforward process because we're just dealing with the, the physics of radiation and an ionized plasma. And uh, so when the universe is ionized, you have, uh, you, you, you have scattering of the photons by the uh, electrons in the ionized universe, and depending on the spatial distribution of the, uh, of, of the microwave background hitting those electrons, you see a degree of linear polarization. So this cartoon just shows what's going on. You have uh, two polarizations uh, coming from a direction in which the radiation is slightly hotter, two from, from the direction in which the radiation is slightly cooler, and just because of the directionality of, of, of scattering, you develop a degree of linear polarization. It's a, it's a, um, this is uh, actually, I, uh, I, I quite often set this problem for um, our graduate students in electromagnetism because it's, it's just graduate student uh, ENM. But the, uh, now this, <laughs> this looks very complicated, but just stick with me. It's, it's not as complicated as it looks, but it's the, the the important thing about this mechanism, and this is what I usually get the students to, to derive uh, as part of uh, their e &M, uh, problem sets, is that you can, only, you can only get this linear polarization if the radiation that's hitting the electron has a quadrupolar distribution in its intensity. Okay, so if you have a dipole, it doesn't work. Higher order multipoles don't work. It has to be a quadrupole. So why would you have quadrupoles in the microwave background. Well, the microwave background is inherently non-uniform, as we showed. It's a very small amount of non-uniformity, but it is non-uniform because, uh, because the quantum fluctuations produced by inflation were not uniform. So the radiation, so, so this electron is sitting, uh, is sitting at a time when the universe was, was ionized and it's, being, uh, it's scattering all these microwave background photons that haven't yet had a chance to decouple. And just because of the non-uniformity of the microwave background, there are um, anisotropies in that radiation. And so there's two ways you can generate uh, a polarized signal. And these cartoons um, are meant to sort of indicate that. So this, these hot, hot, cold, hot, this is a, a plane wave, a Fourier mode in the temperature. And what's happening here is this temperature fluctuation is, is produced by uh, variation in the matter density. So matter is trying to collapse from hot to cold. Okay, eventually radiation pressure is going to push it out again. But it's trying to collapse to cold. And so you've got, you've got matter flowing in from the top and the bottom, and matter flowing out to the sides. And so just from, uh, from Doppler effects, the radiation looks a bit hotter coming from this direction, and it looks a bit colder. The photons that are coming from this direction look a bit colder because the matter is flowing in the other direction. So you end up with, so you end up with a, a quadrupolar distribution of radiation that's hitting an electron that's centered at the middle here. And so you get a quadrupole uh, viewed in any of these directions, so you get polarization. Okay? This is, a, uh, this is a quadrupole produced by gravity waves, so these gravity waves produced by inflation. So you've got a gravity wave stretching and squeezing space. So it's, sque it's squeezing in this direction here, it's stretching in this direction here, and it's squeezing in this direction here. And the same thing's happening. You've got cooler photons coming from the region that's been, uh, I'm sorry, hotter photons that's coming, that been coming from the region that's been stretched and cooler from the other direction, and so you have a quadrupole. Now, the, the math of this is, I, I don't ever sit down and, deri and derive it, I let, <laughs> I let the phenomenologists do it for me, because it's, uh, the, the math is not, it, it's, um, you have to deal with uh, um, 
spin weighted spherical harmonics, and it's just it's just sort of tedious math. But the re the real point, the only important point to take away is that these types of fluctuations are the result of matter fluctuations. So the things that we know are there and that we can see in the temperature and that produce the acoustic peaks. And these gravitational waves cause, uh, cause these uh, slightly different looking quadrupoles and you can tell the difference. You can in principle tell the difference. If you measure the polarization of a region of space, in principle you can determine whether you're looking at a hot or cold spot that was caused by a matter fluctuation or whether it was caused by a gravitational wave. And that's interesting because inflation and other models naturally produce matter fluctuations, but the amount of uh, gravitational waves is very, very dependent on the specific inflationary model, and so it depends on the particle physics of inflation. And again, that's not an area of expertise of mine, but, but, but uh, there are people, um, there are many theory groups around the world trying to calculate that, and there are, uh, uh, there's a vast range of models for inflation, none of which have uh, been seriously tested yet because these gravitational waves are very small. So can we, how do we distinguish this? Well, what we're trying to do, if it's, it's not really any different from measuring polarization in any other, in any other field. Uh, we're, we're looking for Stokes parameters, Q and U, that measure degree of linear polarization. The problem is that we, that we don't expect these modes to be distinguished directly by Q or U because Q and U, the definition just depends on your point of view. If you turn your head 45 degrees, then Q turns into U. So we don't expect, uh, we, in fact, both, uh, both forms of polarization, the, the matter and the gravitational waves, both produce Q and U polarization. We can't use that to distinguish them. But what we can distinguish is what, is what we expect to see in a map. So let's say we have a map of the microwave background with a hot spot, a cold spot, then the patterns of the polarization lines around those hot and cold spots will look different depending on whether we're looking at a density fluctuation or a gravitational wave. And the obvious difference between the two is that these so-called, these are, these are called, referred to as E-modes, um, slightly by analogy with, uh, with the electric field. Um, you can see that there's no parity to those lines. So if you, if you reflect the lines, they look exactly the same. Whereas the B modes uh, have, uh, have a clear directionality to them, and if you, if you uh, make a reflection, you turn this one into this one, okay? So they look quite different. Uh, sometimes these are referred to as curl modes, and these are referred to as curl-free, but that's confusing because in electromagnetism, this is a curl field. So I prefer to just think of them as, as having parity or no parity. So this is the, this is, back to the power spectra. So that, that spectrum that I showed you, this is the temperature spectrum. It's been well measured now. And many, many times fainter, so this is temperature squared. So a factor of about 20 lower, you expect to see these E modes, these parity-free modes. And then if we're lucky, and the universe, uh, the universe has been kind, and uh, our particle uh, theory friends are right, we might see gravitational waves. But there's a big range that's, that we can probe with the microwave background. If the gravitational wave contribution is down here, well, then we won't be able to see it with the microwave background. And we'll need to wait for next many, many generations from now uh, gravitational wave telescopes. But there is this, this window of space where we might be able to detect these gravitational waves. OK, so let me move to quad. So I've already shown you uh, the telescope here. So Quad was commissioned at the South Pole uh, be between, uh, in, in, in the, um, the Austral summer from 2004 to 2005, and it was one of the first experiments specifically designed to measure CMB polarization. That is, it was not an experiment that was designed to look for temperature anisotropy that was then converted to a polarization experiment. So we do this at the South Pole because we are making measurements uh, at 100 and 150 gigahertz, where the microwave background is very bright compared to astrophysical foregrounds. 
But at those frequencies, there is some absor absorption by water in the atmosphere. And so if we go to the pole where the water is all frozen and the water vapor is very low, then uh, we get very, very good transmission. Not only that, at the pole you also have six months with the sun below the horizon, when I'm glad to say that most of us are not there. We have one intrepid overwinterer, and there he is standing there in the middle of summer, but he stays there through the winter when the temperatures plummet. Uh, but we get those, these six very, very cold, very stable months at the pole when the sun is below the horizon, and we can make these measurements. And also, the, the South Pole is, a, is, is very well supported in terms of logistics. There's a, a, a great infrastructure there uh, to fly our equipment in and out and to support our observations. So the goal of QUAD was to make uh, high signal-to-noise measurements actually of the brighter E-mode signal. Now, the E-mode signal is known to be there. We knew uh, ahead of time it was there. There were some measurements uh, from earlier experiments that had hinted at this expected structure. But um, with the exception, perhaps, of of this experiment here, not all of these experiments were consistent with, with just polarization. They, didn't, they weren't actually measuring these, uh, the signature of the acoustic peaks in polarization. And the reason we, there were several reasons we wanted to measure the EMO spectrum. First of all, it's a lot easier to measure than the gravitational wave signal, and it makes sense to walk before you can run. So if you can measure this effectively, then you get some confidence about going on to these B modes. And second, it's because the, um, these E modes are caused by matter fluctuations, you should be able to predict from the temperature what the E mode spectrum should look like. And so if you get something different, then you don't understand what's going on. So it's a, it's a, a very non-trivial test of our understanding of how these fluctuations were produced. So we were aiming to try to measure this signal here. And, and at the same time, get uh, another measurement of temperature at uh, smaller angular scales. So I'll just throw in a couple of pictures. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I, I know that Pierre has been to the pole. <laughs> I don't know uh, how many people here have been to the pole. Uh, just thought you might be interested in what it's like if you haven't. You, uh, the pole, uh, the flying in and out of the pole is handled by, uh, uh, by a contract uh, actually to the New York Air Guard. And uh, they fly you in. On, on, on a fairly large plane uh, from Christchurch in New Zealand to McMurdo. In, in Christchurch, they equip you with all, the, with all the cold weather gear. This is me and this is my graduate student, uh, Jamie Hinderts, who's now a postdoc at NASA Goddard. They fly you into to McMurdo where, where you, you have interesting stuff like mountains. And then you take a second ski equipped plane to the pole where it's completely flat in all directions. This is the uh, South Pole Station. And you can see the plane landing on skis here. I was not on this plane. This was one of my uh, uh, colleagues flying in, and I snapped a picture of their plane. Um, whoops. So uh, here's our telescope. It's on top of a building. So you can actually work at the back of the telescope without uh, getting cold, except if you need to actually work on the top of the telescope. So you have to, uh, it takes 15 minutes to walk from the station to the telescope, which is not a big deal in the summer unless there's a storm. Uh, and my student, uh, Jamie, actually got frostbite one time walking across, just a slash of frostbite across his face. But you can imagine that in the winter, this is not much fun. And our intrepid overwinter did this every day to keep the experiment running. But if you have to work outside, it gets really, really cold. So here they are working on it with blankets over them. It's, uh, especially inside this ground shield where the sun is blocked, it gets really, really cold. So here's our team. This was a, a collaboration. Uh, I was the, the PI in the US of this experiment. Uh, Walter Gere at Cardiff University was uh, the PI for the UK. There were roughly equal contributions from, uh, from the National Science Foundation and from uh, UK uh, PPARC. And uh, we had a, a great deal of help from uh, Clem Pryke at uh, University of Chicago, who have worked on the earlier DAISY experiment that our experiment replaced. Now, if you will indulge me, I do just want to, for one second, draw attention to one of our team members who may have been known in name to some of you who we sadly lost this year. His name was Andrew Lang, and uh, he made the first measurements of the geometry of the universe using this experiment, Boomerang. He was the PI of this experiment. I think it was his crowning scientific achievement. 
And uh, we sadly lost him this year, and that was a huge loss to us and to all the other experiments uh, in this field. And he was my postdoctoral advisor uh, when I was at Caltech, and I want to acknowledge his contribution. And he, he made a huge contribution to this field because they, built the, they developed the detectors that we used. And the detectors we use are bolometers, which are sensitive to heat radiation. They just, they just, uh, um, they just absorb photons, they warm up, and then the temperature change is proportional to the number of photons that have been received. Now, the problem with that process is it's not intrinsically polarization sensitive. You just, you can fling a photon of any polarization on it and uh, the substrate will heat up and you measure the temperature change with a thermistor off to the side, but it's not polarization sensitive. So the big, uh, the, the, um, the technological development that was made, uh, spearheaded by Andrew Lang and his uh, compatriots at Caltech and JPL, was to figure out how to mount two of these bolometers and make each one sensitive to only one polarization by basically building an antenna. So you can see this is sensitive to vertical polarization, this to horizontal, and you put two of them. You can barely see them because you want your substrate to be very, very diffuse so that it heats up very fast when it gets hit by a few photons. And then what you do is you, is you read the temperature change from each of these detectors, and then you take the difference, and that gives you a measurement of Q or U polarization, depending on the orientation. And these ex these uh, detectors are in virtually every bolometric experiment from the ground, and also in the Planck satellite, which just launched and that I might mention at the end. So Quad had uh, uh, 31 pixels, each equipped with a pair of these detectors. <coughs> As I said, we worked at 100 and 150 gigahertz. This is our, this is our funny looking telescope. It's a Cassegrain. Uh, the receiver is down here. Here's the secondary. But we supported the secondary by foam because we didn't want to get stray polarization from reflection from metal feed legs holding up the mirror. So that's why we have that funny looking telescope. This is a picture from where they were putting on the last panel in the ground shield. So we have 31 detectors. Here are the bolometers that were, were put in the back. The feed just couples the telescope to the detector. The uh, camera is about, um, is about yay big. And there were filters in front of the horns to define the band. Because bolometers, not only are they not polarization sensitive, but they're not very picky about frequency either. So you have to put something in front of them to select the frequency. Um, i probably skip this because I'm a bit short of time. But basically, we, we scan across the sky and make a raster map uh, of the sky. And we can rotate the focal plane to make sure we see the same thing. This is a, uh, a quad measurement of a radio galaxy because it's a nice test of quad's ability as a polarimeter. If you're going to measure a signal that's, that's, that's close to undetectable, it's nice to look at one thing that you can see. And this is Centaurus A. This is a radio galaxy. The radio lobes are aligned in this direction. You can see the polarization from synchrotron. You can see that the polarization gets stronger at lower frequencies, as you expect from synchrotron radiation, and, and uh, one of our graduate students, one of the UK students, wrote this up, and it's a nice little paper about, uh, th these, were, these are frequencies where this source has not been measured much before. So here are, here are the maps from Quad. This is a temperature map, and you can see uh, the, the color scales are, the, um, this is, the, my graduate student did this, and, and I actually kind of like this color, this color scale because it makes it look a bit more three-dimensional than the old red and, and blue. But you can see the fluctuations. So these are the primordial fluctuations. These, these objects are radio sources, okay? So we have to excise those from our data. So one of these is Centaurus A, actually. Uh, but the, uh, this is a much larger region. This is about 60 square degrees of sky. And um, this is... <sighs> Hitting the wrong button. Sorry. This is the polarization. Now I hope you can you can see this. But this is these are, this is Q. So this is the vertical polarization. And then this is U. And if I switch between them, you can see you can see the change in direction. Right. This is the first time. So polarization had been detected statistically by a lot of experiments, but this was the first time 
that anyone had actually made a map where you could actually see that the cosmic microwave background is indeed polarized. So that, this was a huge relief because it means that we do understand, <laughs> we do understand fluid dynamics in the early universe. And here are our maps. So these are, here are the, ma the, the maps of the matter fluctuations in polarization. These are the gravitational waves. There's no detection here. This is just instrument noise. It varies across the field because we didn't have a uniform scanning strategy. Okay, so let me just uh, finish with the key results. Okay, so these are very faint signals, and so the analysis is careful and lengthy. So it took us several years to get this out. This is uh, our temperature power spectrum, and this is the correlation between temperature and uh, polarization. And all of these colored, these colored lines along the bottom are very careful attempts to make sure that when we split the data several ways, we get nothing. Okay, so we can split the signal according to, we, could do, we can compare the first half of the season against the second half of the season, so on and so on. And it, it looks fine. So. so we've made high signal to noise measurements. This is our main science result. Here are the E modes. This is the polarization. Here's a quad map. Uh, you, can, you can perhaps look at it and see, you can see an E mode here around a cold spot. You can see an E mode radiating out from a hot spot. You can kind of convince yourself of this. This, wasn't act this has actually been done even more, even better uh, more recently by the WMAP team where they've stacked up their maps and you can see the E mode around the hot spot. Our uh, data agree very well with the standard lambda CDM model. So this is, we passed a non-trivial test here, okay? And because I'm running out of time, uh, this is really our, our prime result. Uh, you can see we made this nice measurement compared with other experiments. We measured the temperature. Uh, the CMB falls off as we expect. And we've measured cosmological parameters. We don't actually have, uh, we, the, our data are very complementary to other uh, experiments. We don't actually increase the sensitivity of these parameters too much. That wasn't our goal, okay? And our B modes were a long way from gravitational waves, so new experiments are being built. But we did a good job. We did better than uh, any other experiment, so we've shown that it is feasible, okay? So summary. Quad was a great success. We learned a lot about experiment design and the analysis of volumetric data in this field. We found that the E-mode spectrum was in good agreement with predictions. So we passed a non, the, the standard model has passed a non-trivial test for the Lambda CDM model. Future experiments with high sensitivity will be needed to detect the much fainter B-mode power spectrum and that's a whole other talk. We're working on experiments now. I can give you an update in four or five years time about the next generation of experiments, but uh, that seems like a good place for me to stop and take questions. Thank you. Sarah, can you uh, give us an idea of, of, of how the, uh, ne the next steps will be made? Are you talking about sure. satellite sure. Uh, observation? Yeah, actually, that's a great, uh, this is not a planted question. But uh, I actually have uh, a picture, some pictures from Planck. So Planck actually has about the same number of detectors as Quad, but it operates from space where the backgrounds are much lower. And uh, so Planck will actually do better than Quad. Planck was launched in 2009. It, it basically is the Quad focal plane on the satellite, as you can see here. Uh, this is early data. This is a press release. Uh, so this will make a very, very much more detailed measurement of the E-mode spectrum. And if the, uh, if the simplest inflationary models are correct, the most natural inflationary models are correct, it could possibly detect the gravitational wave signal. Most people in the field, myself included, think that's probably a stretch for Planck, but it will get very close. And uh, so that will tell us a lot about um, possible contaminants, particularly from astrophysical sources. And then for the next generation, we have to work on increasing the number of detectors. So here's a quad pixel. There are groups working at Caltech and JPL. Uh, this work was, again, initiated by Andrew Lang to, um, build, these, to build these arrays with uh, 256 detectors instead of one sort of hand-built pixel. I'm actually working on amplifiers. This is a radio receiver. 
and uh, we started making those in large arrays. So really increasing the number of pixels is the way to go. So, and these experiments will probably field in a year or two. And, and is it expected that the gravitational wave signal will be isotropic or are we expecting to see it in particular locations and, and how? And which theories say what? Great question, great question. The, um, the gravitational wave signal, if it's detectable, and it may not be detectable, it might be too small, is probably, is most likely isotropic because it's these very, very large uh, scale modes. But, you, but the reason that that's such a good question is because another thing inflation might have done is created some, uh, some anisotropy in the universe so that you, you, uh, you get some directionality to some of, these, uh, some of these modes that are produced by temperature. Uh, and so you, you might, by looking at the EMO spectrum a little closer or the temperature spectrum a little closer, you might see some other telltale signatures of inflation. And that field is called non-Gaussianity because we're looking for deviations from Gaussianity of the fluctuations. And that's, a, that's another area of development. It re requires larger telescopes typically than the telescopes on Planck and, and the quad telescope, but there are people working on uh, experiments in that direction, myself included. So it's a very active area of research. Any questions from the floor? This is more of an instrumental question, but are bolometer arrays applicable to optical astronomy or are they only microwave and radio instruments? So that's a, that's a, a great question too. Uh, the a bolometer, uh, a, a bolometer works by, uh, by using, uh, by, by allowing a photon to create an energy burst in the substrate that's then detected as a temperature rise. So whether you can use them at other wavelengths or not depends on whether you can, uh, whether you can measure that, uh, whether you can measure that photon pulse. So areas in which bolometer arrays have traditionally been used include X-ray astronomy, where the, the photons are so few and far between that you can actually measure the, uh, you can see the rise time, you can see the heat rise time and the heat decay time. And that's now being applied to optical cameras. So it's a way, they're possibly a way to uh, measure not only the intensity of the radiation, but also the, uh, you, can actually, you can actually tag the individual energies of the photons and make spectral measurements uh, as well as uh, intensity measurements. And that's happening uh, uh, in some of the labs at Stanford. Is that, was that your question? Yeah, so it's, yeah, they, they're, because they're very, they, they can just detect anything. They, they're not fussy about frequency. You can use them in a wide range of areas. We don't, we can't actually use the spectral capabilities because the photon stream is just too, uh, the, the, there are just too many photons. We can't measure the individual energies, but at lower photon rates, you can do that. And a, a place where, the, where that kind of uh, thing will be useful is time resolve spectroscopy. So for instance, if you're looking at pulsars, or indeed looking for bursts of, uh, any kind of burst of optical energy, then, then this would be a good detector to use. Uh, do you have any B-mode detector in the de de decadal survey currently? Um, so V, so circular polarization, uh, there are, um, there have not, there has not up until now be much interest in measuring circular polarization of the microwave background because uh, it, it was hard to think of a good mechanism for uh, producing it because magnetic fields were expected to be fairly weak in the early universe. Now, uh, there's no limit to the imagination <laughs> of my theory colleagues and people are coming up with reasons why we might want to measure V polarization. With a bolometric detector where you're just measuring the two linear uh, directions of polarization, and you don't retain any phase information about those two directions of the electric field. You just can't, you cannot measure circular polarization. With an amplifier system, you can. You can retain some sensitivity to uh, circular polarization. And I, uh, I'm working, I'm still continuing to work with bolometers, but I'm also working with amplifier systems. They're a little less sensitive, but they do have more flexibility in trying to measure V polarization or trying to, uh, uh, to build interferometers to do other types of research with the microwave background and to do spectroscopy even. So, but I don't know uh, uh, where 
measurements of VMO polarization are going to go. But my suspicion is once we've exhausted all we can do with the linear polarization of the microwave background, someone will say, but wait, you should measure circular polarization. So. I was just going to ask if you might just comment on your research with Sonyaev Zelodovich effect. Sure, I, yeah. I was guessing you looked for that in the E-modes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, unfortunately I don't have any uh, slides with me um, that, that really talk much about that, but um, if I just go back to the temperature, to the temperature maps. So we don't see anything, so uh, a cluster, a typical cluster of galaxies in this map would be sort of typically about this size. We have a very, uh, this is 60 square degrees, our telescope is fairly low resolution, and so uh, the, the uh, cluster would be about the same size as the point source because all those sources are smaller than the beam. We did look for, uh, we looked for the sunyaev zeldovich effect in the temperature. Uh, it shows up at uh, millimeter wavelengths as a hole in the microwave background because the uh, the photons get scattered to slightly higher frequencies. That was the effect that Sunyaev and, Sunyaev and Zoldovich proposed. In polarization, we don't expect to see very much uh, polarization, but the sunyaev zoldovich effect does create uh, an anisotropy in temperature. It's produced at a later time than the cosmic microwave background, typically at a redshift of one, but it is an anisotropy in the microwave background. And so it will polarize, it, there will be some polarized component to it, but it's expected to be very tiny. But one of the things you could do if you could measure that is that you could measure, uh, you could actually make a measurement of the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background from a different vantage point in the universe. So you can think of the sunyaev zoldovich effect, the scattering uh, by the, the electrons in the clusters as being sort of like a, uh, a very low efficiency telescope located at a redshift of one sending you uh, CMB photons that were never going to hit you but that have scattered off this cluster and now coming in your direction. Uh, so that again, that's an area with some theoretical uh, papers but uh, is well out of the range of the instrument people right now. That's not to say that in the future we won't consider it but that's quite an exciting thought to be able to measure uh, to, to measure what the microwave background looked like from a different place in the universe and, and could enable us to probe uh, theories such as um, landscape theories of the early universe where we, we live in one bubble, uh, one bubble that formed out of the, um, uh, out of, uh, uh, so out of, the words, uh, our universe nucleated out of a background of, of, uh, that was inflating and you might be able to, we might be able to see to the edge of our bubble by looking from a different vantage point in the universe. It's very speculative, but kind of interesting. So. Sarah, you mentioned that there was a, uh, the, the dark region uh, in front of the last scattering surface. Uh, can you use the, the uh, sunyaev zoldovich effect to probe that area, or why not? Um, you, you can't, so the, the universe is, let's see if I can get my mouse, well, let's use, okay, so the universe is, uh, the, the microwave background is released here, typically this is about a redshift of one, one to five, this is where clusters and, and stars form. The sunyaev zeldovich effect requires you to have very, very hot gas to scatter the photons, a very, very, it's a very, it's scattering by very diffuse, uh, diffuse patches of hot gas in, in clusters. Now between, between uh, a redshift of about five and um, this redshift of 1100, which is where the microwave background was released, the, uh, the universe is believed, uh, certainly to about here, to be neutral. And then we know that the universe reionized at some, uh, at some epoch. But in this region here, the, the gas is, is entirely neutral. It, when, when uh, I, I, I believe uh, a lot of you are probably here when Tom Abel came and gave a talk from Stanford and he has these beautiful animations of the universe being dark and then, and then uh, reionization taking place as stars switched on and started to create ionized bubbles. 
And so you, you, don't get any, you won't get any Sunyav's or Lovich effect until you get to about here when you have that brain diffuse gas. But you can perhaps probe this region. This is not something I work on, uh, and I'm not an expert in it, but you can, you can probe that region by looking for uh, uh, neutral hydrogen, redshift, redshifted neutral hydrogen lines. Uh, and, and you can look for anisotropy in that signal just as you can the microwave background. It will be much harder than the microwave background because it's not such a simple, uh, it's not such simple physics going on, but it's a very active area of research uh, uh, that a lot of you probably know about because it's a, it's a goal of the SKA and the ATA will serve as a, as a pathfinder for some of this kind of thing. So, but I'll stop there because I'm not an expert and so I don't want to say things that are not correct. <laughs> uh, so, <coughs> Sarah, this may be a little bit far-fetched question uh, pertaining to this particular topic, but you are co constantly talking about the, the electrons, and I am very dark on leptogenesis. Can you tell us a little bit? Sorry. Uh, leptogenesis. Oh, no, no, I know. <laughs> you probably know, so I, pr I probably know only as much as you do, so, yeah. Okay, if there's no further uh, Questions, sir. We have a uh, special SETI pin oh, well, for you, you so uh, to commemorate How your lovely. talk. How lovely! Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed visiting. So. Please join me. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.